I'm, I'm, I'm John Pincus. I'm software engineer, software architect by background, been a long term privacy a activist, worked with uh, electron EFF since the 90s, really. Um, and I run a mailing list in Washington State, the Washington Privacy Organizers, where we've been pretty involved in state legislation and federal legislation as well. Awesome. And I'm Maya Morales. Um, often can be found organizing with John on this stuff. Um, I am an educator, um, activist, community organizer, and artist. Um, it was in instrumental in helping pass a ban, a municipal ballot initiative um, that banned face recognition and predictive policing tech in my city. Um, and went on to do a bunch of legislative advocacy for Washington State and have also um, been diving into federal legislation. So i um, glad to be invited here to chat with you all about the alphabet soup of privacy legislation um, this evening, afternoon for us, evening for y'all. Um, all right, so the first thing that we want to start off with is just to offer our gratitude um, to all of you for being here. Uh, to EF Georgia and to Scott for organizing this and streaming it, getting that set up um, on Twitch, I think also on FB. Um, and also to everyone who shared and boosted the event and lifted it up. Um, thanks for making the time to hang out with us and um, grateful that you're tuning in to Data Privacy. So thank you. Um, we also would love to just like thank you in advance for um, taking the actions that we throw into the chat later and being willing to learn more about this stuff, um, educating your friends and family and coworkers, um, sharing everything that you learned here around. So, um, yeah, let's let's uh, we're thankful. <laughs> um, and then just before we dive into the soup, um, thank you for this lovely image. Whoever made this. Um, just some comments on moderation and safe spaces. I think this is probably goes without saying, but in whatever chat that you see, whether you're um, in the webinar with us on B Big Blue Button or whether you're um, on Twitch or on Facebook, please keep the chat friendly and respectful um, and keep it a safe space for everybody. Um, and then also just wanted to welcome you to like, if there are any terms that we use or questions that come up for any of you on privacy concepts or technology, um, just anything like that, go ahead and just put it in the chat. And if we can, as we're speaking, we'll just address it as we're going. Um, and if it's a bigger, chunkier topic, we'll just save it to the end to the Q&A, but you can go ahead and, um, and throw those questions out there. There are never any bad questions. Um, if you don't know, that's okay. We're, we're here to talk about it. And if you don't know, there are probably other people who don't know either, so please ask. So this is kind of our agenda um, for this evening, um, is to just talk about organizing and mobilizing our communities on federal data privacy laws post overturn of Roe. So we know that we're in a, a pretty um, unprecedented moment where um, after the overturn of Roe, it's really called into question for so many more people who maybe previously didn't pay much attention to the need for privacy legislation, um, are really turning their attention to the fact that, oh gosh, maybe this is um, going to affect me a little more than I thought it would. Um, and so this is kind of a pivotal moment for us um, in thinking about the role of the Supreme Court in removing rights versus advancing them, um, and looking at what we may need to do federally and in states um, to ensure our, our rights and liberties. So we're gonna go through, um, gonna give a brief overview of youth privacy bills. Um, that will be a fairly short segment because that isn't something that um, John and I have been like deeply working with, although we do work with folks who are. Um, then we'll look at the American Data Privacy Protection Act, the ADPPA. Um, that has been heard. It's um, had a, a draft revision prior to August recess, and so it's still somewhat in play, although we'll get into that more later. Um, and then we'll also take a look at My Body, My Data Act, the Health and Location Data Protection Act, and the Fourth Amendment is Not for Sale Act. Um, so I'm going to turn that over to John to start diving into federal youth privacy bills. So, you know, it's, it's think of the children. Uh, 
children really do get targeted by a lot of pretty abusive data practices on time. And, there, and there's broad bipartisan agreement that, yeah, something should be done. Our current federal legislation on that is COPPA, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, which protects kids up to 12 years old. That everybody agrees that's not good enough. It's also kind of old. I think it's from the 90s, really. And so it needs a lot of updates. Oh, okay, um, I will try to project. Thanks for the feedback, Aaron. Um, so everybody agrees that that COPPA needs updating. There are actually six different bills, six different child privacy bills, all with their own acronyms, uh, introduced in Congress from representatives on both parties, many with bipartisan sponsorship. This is an area where people work very effectively across party lines. Uh, the two that are going forward, both in the Senate currently, one is the Children and Teens Online Privacy Protection Act, CTAPA. Basically, this updates the existing COPPA and it extends it to 13 to 15 year olds. I mean, 16 and 17 year olds are teenagers also. You'd think they'd get protection, but no. One of the dynamics here is tech companies really want to minimize how much they have to do here. And so they've pushed back pretty strongly. The current proposal is to extend it to 13 to 15 year olds. There's some good things in this bill. There's some not so good things in this bill. The Senate Judiciary Hearing ha Committee had a hearing on it, and they've actually advanced it. The way these bills work is they need to get through the appropriate committee in whatever chamber they're introduced in first, the House or the Senate. Once the committee advances it, then it goes to the floor, then it goes to the other chamber. Same thing, first committee, then floor. Um, so this advance from the, uh, the Senate committee, the next step is possibly the Senate floor they won't bring it there unless they're confident that they have enough votes to, to, uh, to get it through. The Kids Online Safety Act also uh, got advanced by the Senate Judiciary Committee. This is, it's a complement to the, uh, the, the, the to CTAPA. It requires tech companies to prevent harm to minors and it mandates some transparency in algorithms. And this is a huge problem gets talked a lot about in terms of Instagram targeting algorithms to uh, teen girls that that feed into their eating disorders. Frances Haugen talked about that, the Facebook whistleblower, she talked about that in her congressional testimony and it made a huge impression on legislators. There's agreement that something needs to be done here. So that had unanimous support in the Senate committee. But there's a problem with, with these bills, a challenge really. How does a site know whether somebody's a minor? There's a couple of different possible legal standards here. One is called actual knowledge. You know, if they know somebody's age, well, they can compute it's a minor. How do they know somebody's age? Well, they've told them or they've looked it up in some way. But if they don't ask for age, well, then they don't have to treat people as a minor. If the bill says actual knowledge, as COPPA does, that's a big loophole. Another alternate standard is if the site knows or should have known that somebody's a minor. As somebody said in one of the hearings, they've got enough information that they can target these ads at kids. That's enough information to figure out that they're kids, right? It's a good idea in principle, but, but the risk is that it pushes all these sites to do mandatory ID checks so that they can do age checks. You know, California's just has a new kids design code somewhat si similar to um, uh, KOSA and Facial recognition vendors love this because, well, I mean, the site's going to use facial recognition, right? That's really bad from a privacy perspective. EFF opposes um, the Kids Online Safety Act, and what their call to action says is the solution to kids' privacy isn't more surveillance. Uh, I will I will drop a link in the chat on 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 that here uh, to uh, to EFF's action. We're going to be dropping actions throughout this, a lot of them from uh, EFF's site. Um, you know, it's, they make it very easy to contract, contact your legislators and let them know what you think of it. Okay. So moving on, so uh, any, if there's any questions on the kids' privacy bills, please drop them in chat. And let's move on. ADPPA is a comprehensive privacy bill, or more accurately, a consumer privacy bill. 
This protects a lot of online activities. The goal is to create a standard US data privacy regulation. Right now, California has a privacy bill, which is decent. A few other states have weaker privacy bills, worse than California. Their goal is to create a standard US data privacy regulation. Businesses love the idea of having a single regulation that they just have to obey to. This bill's got some good things in it. It's, it's got civil rights protections that prohibit online discrimination. So that's, that's very important. That's a really big deal. There's a caveat here, though. The bill doesn't have any whistleblower protections. The WIP bill has some requirements for companies to fill out algorithmic impact assessments so that you can see if they're discriminating, but they're very, very weak. So it's not clear that these civil rights protections are strong enough to be real. Well, actually, I'd go farther. In the current version of the bill, the civil rights protections are not strong enough to be real. A good thing about the bill is it focuses on data minimization. This is a term of art in privacy law requiring companies to minimize how much data they collect and only use the data for the purpose that they collected. So if they've collected it to deliver you a package, well, of course they can deliver it, use it to deliver you a package, that's good, but they shouldn't be able to use it for other things without your protection. Most modern data privacy bills have that. So does ADPPA. And again, there's a caveat. There's lots of exceptions here. One of the exceptions is, well, they can use it for targeted advertising unless you opt out. Hmm, that's not really all that minimized. Good thing about the bill is it's got a duty of loyalty, which is a valuable and relatively new concept in privacy laws. It says just like banks and other financial uh, institutions can only use your data, can't use your data, your financial information against you, they have to use it in your best interests. Companies shouldn't be able to use your data either. The great idea, there's a caveat again, of the duty of loyalty in ADPPA, I always call it the duty of loyalty, because it's only part of what a real duty of loyalty should build. Yeah, the, um, the, the question about COPPA and COSA relates to the data minimization. What collection limits are recommended in those bills? A very good question. Uh, and I don't have a great answer to it, I'm afraid. As Maya said, we haven't uh, dug into it that strongly. They do, um, COPPA in particular has does have some good data minimization requirements, but I haven't looked in detail at the exceptions. Uh, COPPA prohibits using it, prohibits, completely prohibits targeted advertising against kids. And so you can't use your data to target ads. That's good. Maya. Can I just, I just wanna pipe in really quickly that in terms of the caveats, um, in both of really both of those areas, data minimization and duty of loyalty. I mean, one of the problems is that there's a huge caveat for improving a product or research purposes. Um, and so there's a concern and a worry that companies um, can simply sort of use that as a pretext, right, for collecting more and more data um, because it's serving the purpose of improving the product. Um, or making it work better for folks, so. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a great point. Washington's attorney general flagged that in a discussion draft saying, wow, this is basically a license for tech companies to hold on to data forever because you might need it to improve the product and, and do whatever they want with it. There's products improvements, there's internal research. It's, it's a hard problem, really. It's like, as a software engineer, wow. I mean, there's also an exception for debugging and maintaining the software. Yeah, as a, as a software engineer, I kind of I kind of need that, right? It's like if if some of the data that customers provided is causing my program to crash or behave badly, well, I really want to be able to use that in the debugging. Mm. But that can be taken too far when it's, we go to product improvements and internal research. And I think EFF has been very concerned that that um, the uh, data minimization has some overly broad. Uh, they call them permissible purposes what you're allowed to use the data for without consent. And EFF is concerned that they're too broad. Some of the major downsides of the, of the bill in its current draft, I mean, it, it can still be approved. There, there's amendments possible, but you know, it doesn't protect lesbian, gay, bi, trans, queer, intersex, asexual, two-spirited people. There's a lot of big loopholes related to that. It doesn't deal with, with really deal with the data broker problems. 
there's some protections of, against data brokers, but but they're very weak. We'll contrast that with a later bill that Maya's going to talk about that that's got strong protections. No sales by data brokers. Ah, oh, that's good. ADPPA, wah. It doesn't protect people who have uteruses from from being surveilled post row. I mean, this this is a a huge challenge, and it's really almost scary that people haven't been talking a lot about this in the hearings. I kind of call it the um, the the elephant in the room. Here's a um, here's a post that I've done on uh, on the, the nexus of privacy, my my newsletter, looking at the uh, the post row threats, questions as to how well it deals with this. We've got another slide on this coming up. Doesn't address law enforcement surveillance. Maya, Maya this is something that you really focused on a lot. Do you want to you say something about this? Sure, yeah. Um, there, there are just blanket exceptions and exemptions for law enforcement purposes. Um, and we know that, you know, many of you may be aware of um, recent lawsuit by Just Futures Law, um, looking at the data broker loophole in terms of targeting um, immigrant communities and skirting sanctuary laws. That's one um, big example. Another very, um, you know, recent example that we're seeing around biometric data um, is this case of um, a Jane Doe, a woman in San Francisco who, um, you know, contributed her DNA in a rape kit and several years later um, that was used in a criminal investigation against her. Um, you know, there are many different ways. I mean, that wasn't a data broker issue, but in terms of law enforcement loopholes, there's really a need to clamp down um, on what kinds of data can and cannot be shared with and used um, by law enforcement. And, and, and ADPPA just simply doesn't deal with that at all. Um, and so I think, you know, we're really, um, Many, many communities are quite concerned about that and feeling like not only does it not uh, protect pregnant people, <laughs> LGBTQIA2S people, but additionally, anybody um, already over targeted by law enforcement is still at risk. So I'll pass it back to you, John. Yeah, and I dropped a link in the chat with the, uh, the lawsuit that, that Maya talked about. It's also lots of exemptions of various pizza, pieces of the bill. Uh, you know, one that I'm particularly upset about is government providers who act as service providers to government, they don't have to fill out any of these algorithmic impact assessments, which are supposed to protect our civil rights. Well, wait a second. They're the ones who are using this data to violate people's civil rights. Shouldn't they have to fill out the algorithmic impact assessment? You know, I don't, I don't know how many of you here are from a security background. I've done a lot of security work, and I think of this a lot in terms of threat modeling. You know, look, let's look at the threats um, the post row threats to that this bill, my analysis is that it probably doesn't address these. I, I'll caveat that by saying I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but you know, the lawyers I've talked to say, yeah, these are some serious questions. This is actually something that um, uh, Representative Eshu from California, who, who represents Silicon Valley. So, um, you know, she's pretty tech savvy as Congress people go. She, she brought up the prosecutors. Actually, she talked about sinister prosecutors in states that criminalize abortion, how they can use location data to identify people visiting reproductive health care facilities. You know, th this is bad. If people travel out of state to get abortions, does ADPPA protect their data? Actually, this is one where the answer is clearly no. Airlines and other transportation common carriers are exempt from ADPPA. They're just not covered by this at all. And so that data gets no protection at all. Sabre, the airline reservation system, they, they share data with governments today. Um, Anti-abortion crisis pregnancy centers. And a lot of the people who visit crisis, crisis pregnancy centers go on to uh, make other decisions about their pregnancy. Can these crisis pregnancy centers share data with law enforcement or in states that have civil enforcement of their, their uh, criminalized abortion, can they share it with vigilantes? And this ties to, to the enforcement question. If crisis pregnancy centers break the law and violate people's privacy, can they be held accountable? One of the exemptions Maya talked about is that you know, in, people can sue if a company breaks your law in some situations, 
One of the situations they can't do is if the company makes annual revenue of less than $25 million, which covers a lot of crisis pregnancy centers. Yeah, if I can I add one thing there, John? Please. Um, I, one of the issues around people traveling right now to get abortions, as well as abortion funds and how those monies move, um, is that we know that because there are simply no protections around any of the data that's collected and because there is just such lack of public education about how data work, how data collection works, how privacy works, how um, much of your data is collected, sold, shared. Most people don't even really know how to use the very basic controls that we do have. Um, and so it's hard to even have the discussion in some ways about how much more we need when people don't even know um, the very sort of small and limited amount that they have. Um, there are like, you know, currently these discussions about, I don't know if you all have heard of this Be Real um, video thing where you um, basically show where you are um, as like a selfie and then you flip the camera and show where you are so that you get like a more realistic sense of um, somebody's messy room, for instance, when they're about to do a TikTok. This is kind of like a newer um, engaging like video tool and that's tracking location data. Um, and so a lot of folks, um, younger folks using that may have no idea um, that they're actually can be mapped to the their exact location. And one of the problems with ADPPA is that the way that it defines um, geolocation data is within a certain number of feet. But when you're in a rural area, that is um, basically not helpful in terms of privacy and protection um, around abortion healthcare, because unless you're in an extremely dense urban area, um, limiting, you know, geolocation to not precise, but a general and broad kind of location doesn't help you. The clinic is going to be in a, you know, what is essentially a four block radius in a city is basically on its own in a strip mall or um, even a, an independent standing building in a rural area. So there are other things like that that are extremely problematic um, for folks seeking abortion health care in other states. And, and something I want to highlight is we're focusing here specifically on abortion this is not the only people who, who are threatened by this. We, Maya and I were watching a uh, really good webinar with uh, Danielle Citrone, a, a law press professor who's done a lot of great work here. And she brought up, oh, gun owner, owners. California has, has a uh, gun law, which has the same kind of civil enforcement that lets individuals go after gun owners and, and say that they're violating the California law. That's, you know, that's, a, that's a threat to gun owners. The uh, California Department uh, that regulates gun ownership, they had they had a huge data leak. I mean, I, it only affected uh, judges who owned guns, but uh, geez, you really don't want to be leaking their home data, home late, home information on the uh, on the internet. So the the failure to regulate government agencies has a similar effect there. Right, and as Maya brings up, people seeking seeking gender affirming health care, same issues come up. You know, there's lots of areas that can be improved to create better protections. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these. We can we can take questions if we want. The one I do want to hi highlight, though, is the very first one: a floor, not a ceiling. So ADPPA, as it current as it's currently rewritten, preempts all state and stronger state and local laws. So the state of Maine is very upset about this. They've got a strong in ISP privacy law that they worked with EFF to help get them passed. That would go away under this. Seattle has the broadband privacy ordinance. That would also go away. And it's not just current. Like California has, has their law. They are very, 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 very upset. And Speaker Pelosi is from California. And so that's, that's putting a roadblock in terms of the ADPPA. But it's not just California. And it's not just current laws. It's future laws. I mean, Maya's, Maya's oh, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I would just add to that, that in terms of setting a floor, not a ceiling, you know, the other problematic piece, even if they were to try to do, you know, a long list of preemptive carve outs, right, so that they didn't preempt everything that they preempted, um, you know, certain things, it would generally, um, the versions of that that we've seen, uh, don't take into account any strengthening of consumer 
focused law. So, you know, ultimately what we are learning and what, what we know more and more about um, in the last couple of months, this has really come to light in, in many thanks to um, the awareness that is raised because of the overturn of Roe, we've really been seeing a lot of information about commercial data surveillance. And so we know that that is an angle at which we must target data privacy and surveillance if our ability to legislate on anything commercial is taken away um, and we just have these, you know, very sort of like finite, tricky list um, of nuanced uh, um, exemptions to preemption that may also even involve lawsuits for state to pursue. It's, it's really um, very problematic for our future privacy as well as our current privacy. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the um, right now the bill is kind of stalled uh, because of the uh, preemption issue, specifically focusing on California. There's just been an, uh, an idea for a new compromise floated that gives California a waiver and throws the other 49 states under the bus. Um, uh, my guess is that probably won't go forward, but it just uh, shows the kinds of dynamics here. There, you know, there's there's so much more to say here. I'll, I'll drop EFF's link in about America deserves better. Uh, and oh yeah, one, one last thing. Ah, there's a great loophole in there, which which probably lets telecoms avoid $200 million in fines that the FCC has assessed. I think it's safe to say that that lobbying has had some effect on this bill, and we'll get to that later. Uh, qu questions on ADPPA before we move on? Yeah, I mean, any, any and every question um, that may have come up, we're happy to answer before we dive into these others. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and say I did. I did just have a question that I figure if one person has it, maybe others do, um, about the acronym for LGBTQIA two uh, S. So the A um, generally stands for asexual, and two S is stands for two spirit, which is an indigenous identification for um, sort of gender and sexuality, um, which is really a belief that a person embodies uh, a sort of two spirited um self uh within one body so hopefully that helps anyone else who has that question this is scott um i just wanted to say that there are a couple of questions that are in the chat um, yeah yeah i was just well oh, let's see so i think i've responded to aaron's i was just about to get to uh, watson's um on okay. what does a strong duty of loyalty look like did you get some other questions that didn't go to the public chat scott no i i just see what you see okay Okay, so yeah, uh, a question from Watson of what a strong duty of loyalty looks like. That's a great question. I dropped a link in the in the chat from Woodrow Herzog and uh, Neil Richards. They're two privacy scholars who have done, you know, the, they're the experts on the duty of loyalty. What, what they note is that uh, the ADPPA's duty of loyalty is really just data minimization. That's That's good, that's important, but data loyalty rules should also cover manipulation, breaches of confidentiality, wrongful discrimination, and reckless and extractive engagement models. ADPPA's got some coverage of some of these things, but they don't fall under the duty of loyalty, and other things are completely not even mentioned in the ADPPA. Yeah, really good question. Are there any other questions before we move on on any of the platforms, Scott? Uh, no, I don't have any. Uh, let's see. Uh, hang on. Too many windows. Uh, okay. Yeah, no, I don't see any questions. Let's go ahead. Okay, so we'll move on to, um, so that was the ADPPA or the American Data Privacy and Protection Act. Um, let's move on to um, the other three bills that we wanna talk about um, this evening. So My Body, My Data Act. Um, this is actually a very short and succinct bill, which is always delightful to read when you're doing legislative uh, organizing and advocacy. Um, the goal of this is to create a standard U.S. data privacy regulation on health data post row. So really looking at um, getting f pregnant 
or potentially pregnant people some safety. Um, it has major upsides. It does not pre preempt stronger state and local laws. Um, it's very clear in that. Um, it does not allow weakening, but it does not preempt stronger um, laws. It's written in a very clear, inclusive way, um, and the definitions are incredibly clear and specific. So um, as opposed to a bill like ADPPA or the bad Washington Privacy Act uh, that we slogged through as well, um, it, just, it just has very lovely uh, definitions. Um, there are very clear explanations and expectations around obtaining consent um, for people's data. Um, that is a, a real upside to this bill. Um, it's got great data minimization requirements. Um, it has a timely right of access and deletion of health data. I believe it's 15 days in the version that I have. Um, so a person could request that their, their data um, be accessed and deleted and, and the company uh, would have to respond within 15 days, which is great. Um, not something that you see in a lot of other big bills that we've looked at. Um, it would protect uter uterus having people from being surveilled essentially post row because um, it would give a lot more control um, over health data. And it has very good enforcement provisions as well. Um, it allows for private right of action, allows attorney generals to take action. Um, so there's there's a good strong enforcement there. Um, there are some improvements we'd like to see. So um, it'd be great to include all health data as protected under this bill. It is limited to reproductive health. Um, and so in the interest of, you know, we know that there is a concerted effort to erode the rights of trans people um, and accessing care. And so it'd be great. Um, and, you know, mental health care. There's all kinds of other health data that really needs protecting. Um, and isn't necessarily always completely separate from someone obtaining abortion health care, actually. So it'd be great if there was um, an inclusion of all health data in this bill, and we'd love to see that change. Um, and the right to delete all of that data as well. Do you want to add anything on this bill, John? Um, yeah, as Maya mentioned earlier, it's been introduced. It hasn't had a hearing yet. I think this is one of the places where people taking action, contracting your representatives can really make a difference. Uh, from what we hear, they're debating about whether to move forward on this bill. And so this is, this is definitely a please take action case. I think the- I dropped, the, I dropped the link in the chat. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, so that link that's on the bottom of the slide is now in the chat and EFF has got an action on that. Um, one of the things that makes this a strong one to to um, share with others and to push your lawmakers to sponsor and um, support, share with friends around the country to do that as well, um, is that it is probably less problematic for uh, companies in some ways than um, some of the other protections we'll look at next, which involve location data. It doesn't make it um, any less important, but it definitely um, is an easier push. Um, to, to probably get through. So let's look at the, um, actually, before we do that, should I just um, see if there's any questions on that? Anybody have questions about my body, my data? I don't see any in the public chat, so I'm gonna move on. And then if there are any, we'll, we'll return to that. Um, so the other great bill um, to, oh, okay. How does it relate to HIPAA? Yes, it does. Um, it does comply with all and doesn't um, restrict any sharing that is required under HIPAA, Aaron. Um, so yeah. it's it's compatible with HIPAA. All of these bills basically have a section that say, oh, for 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 the institutions that are covered entities under HIPAA, which is generally only doctors, hospitals, insurance agencies, it's very limited. And for the specific data that's covered by them, so stuff on their website isn't may or may not be covered. But, but the bills don't cover that because HIPAA is strong enough. These complement HIPAA. So it would really be um, those folks who facilitate healthcare data flow, right? So the third parties and the companies that um, have access to that healthcare data, apps that have access to that healthcare data. Sometimes they work in conjunction 
um, with HIPAA covered entities as well. So it, it really targets um, those folks. I hope that answers your question, Erin. Um, all right, so um, the Health and Location Data Privacy Act. Um, uh, wait, oh, um, we have one more question. <laughs> yeah, let's look at that. So for my body, my data, are there any thoughts on how we see the private right of action playing out with such a broadly applicable uh, law? Huh. So, um, you know, there's, there's always a risk with a private right of action. There's always a risk that it just creates a, uh, a payday for lawyers filing nuisance suits who just get some settlement just to get them go, go away. That's a lot less likely to happen for something like Health and Location Data Privacy Act, which is very narrowly focused on just the health information. Right? That was it's, relating to my body, my data, John. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, and, and I meant to say my body, my data. <laughs> my bad for having the uh, other slide up. That's less of a problem for my body, my data, which is just very narrowly focused on the, um, on the health information. There's uh, the, the people who testified about the private right of action for the on, on ADPPA, they were from uh, they they re represented the convenience store trade association. They're saying, yeah, mom and pop corner shop. You don't want to expose them to just lawyers doing nuisance suits against them. Fair enough, but they're not they're they're not likely to be implicated under my body my data. Cool. I think we can move on. Um... Shall we? Yeah. All right. So let's let's dive into the Health and um, Location Data Privacy Act. It's actually protection, um, not privacy. So it should say Health and Location Data Protection Act. Um, sorry about that, y'all. Um, so this one obviously has the goal of protecting folks um, on some similar levels, health data, but also via that big location loophole. Um, so. There are lots of upsides to this. Um, again, uh, doesn't it has the same kind of clear writing as as the previous bill, my body, my data. It doesn't preempt um, stronger state and local laws, so it um, does not allow a weakening, but it does allow a strengthening of the law. Um, it's very clear. It's got very um, inclusive um, and also specific definitions. Um, it's got those clear expectations for obtaining consent um, to data collection and it would protect uterus having people from being surveilled post row in the um, particularly on the location data problem that we're seeing it's got good enforcement pro uh, provisions um, basically the same as the other bill um, and this one is a lot trickier because you know we're seeing apple we're seeing google roll out these um, user platforms that are now doing ad targeting based on location data. So there's a lot more sort of money at stake here um, with big corporations who are now like wanting to move into a location based plus biometrics based um, system where folks will have their location data be key to them you know, hearing about a service. And so there's this sort of trickiness here um, that makes this bill, I think, a little bit more challenging to look at passing, to be perfectly frank. But I think it also is a really great opportunity for us to kind of hold our lawmakers' feet to the fire and say, hey, look, you know, if we're really protecting people in this era post row and post who knows whatever else is coming <laughs> um, regarding you know, the possible rolling back of rights, we really have to push back on the availability of location data um, to any and everyone who wants it. And people really, really need to be able um, to offer non-coerced affirmative consent on that. It's so important that people um, be able to control who has access to our location. Um, it, some there are some improvements we'd like to see in this bill. So like no exclusion for um, some of the bigger platforms like Facebook, Meta, Google, Apple, app developers, um, and, th and third party health data contractors and researchers. So this is specifically targeting data brokers. And we'd really like to see that expand to all entities um, and non-coerced affirmative consent for, for all and any sharing of health and location data is something I put in is something I'd like to see. You um, can pipe in if you feel differently, John, but I'm pretty sure you agree. Um, we'd also like to see um, 
I just noted this on my second reading of the bill that I'd really like to see um, predictions and inferences included in several of the definition sections because we're really seeing um, that that is a critical area for data privacy in terms of AI and algorithms. We really need to have um, those kinds of things protected and dealt with in our definitions and our privacy laws. Um, yes, John agrees. That's rad. Um, let's see. Anything else you want to add here on that, John? Or are you good? I, I'm going to take it that. Okay, yeah. you, you changed slides. So you're good. I'm, I'm just I'm watching the time, and um, we should want to spend some time future casting. So, <laughs> and then yes. so this is a really important bill, so I want to make sure we do it justice. Cool. Take it away. So the Fourth Amendment is not for sale act. This bill um, prohibits government agencies from buying data without a warrant. If they'd usually need a, a warrant to get the data, it says they can't end run around the Fourth Amendment by just buying the data, which they do all the time today, all the time. The Fog Reveal from EFF, EFF just did this great article on this very sleazy small location data company that that sells to law enforcement uh location tracking they can they track your location over months right? they can just bring it up in a window and just watch everywhere you've gone for months on a budget without a warrant this is something where there's very strong bipartisan agreement that something needs to be done here i watched the uh, the hearing in the house Set a hearing in House Judiciary Committee, and man, the um, the, the the chair Jerry Nadler, <laughs> progressive Democrat, the um, the ranking member Jim Jordan, conservative, they are seeing eye to eye on this. The guy from Right on Crime, which is a very uh, they're at, from the Texas public policy issue, I don't agree with them on many issues, but he was saying words that could come out of my mouth that no matter what party in government is in power, they are very likely to, to, to abuse the data they have. Followed by Pramila Jayapal, our representative from Seattle, very progressive representative, her saying, the federal government has built out this huge surveillance infrastructure. We have to do something. So there, there's a lot, of, a lot of support for this bill. Uh, the the upsides yeah it, it allows stronger state and local laws although you know it's it's hard to imagine something stronger than you need a warrant um it covers data it covers everybody uh it's it's got very good language for obtaining court warrants this is co-sponsored by uh senators wyden and paul both of whom are known as being amongst the best on privacy within their respective parties and Wyden in particular has been doing this for years and years and years. He's usually right. Not always, but usually. And so this is very well crafted. Yeah, this, this helps any threat that you name, this is going to help with. It's going to help everybody with. And in particular, when we've got these post-row surveillance threats, it's going to help with that. And it gives greater protection to the people who, who the harms fall the most on today, who are, who are most targeted by all these things. Maya, you're. I think you kind of you muted yourself, uh, John, so I didn't hear that question. Oh, uh, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I I agree, and I um I just think this is a really really strong um, bill since it you know not every strong bill that has bipartisan support is one you know we want to put forward. I mean, we have a lot of issues with ADPPA, but um, this one is a standout. Um, it amends existing law, so it's not sort of a standalone um, piece. It um, is something that, frankly, is long overdue. And so I think I think it's something that is really important to um, spread the word on, talk it up with folks, um, do the action that, that EFF has put out there. I know ACLU also has an action um, on this bill as well. So whatever, you know, however you want to take that <laughs> I, I, I dropped them both in the chat i think whichever works and then you know another thing is you don't have to use any of these action forms just call the congressional switchboard or look up your congress person's web form everybody in congress has a web form nobody publishes their email but everybody's got a web form i'll drop the link in later where you can go there just send them mail saying what you want you can use the language on these sites as 
as an example or just write your own from scratch. What really matters is that they hear from people. I also dropped a few more links in there about the- And actually you could even use the slide. I mean, we've listed out some major upsides and reasons why this is great. You could even use um, this material if you wanted. Yeah, take a screenshot of the slide. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and, you know, back to what, why are we focusing on this so much? So here, here's the dynamics on this bill in Washington from, from what we've heard from people who are there. This bill had a really positive hearing. Everybody said they wanted to go ahead with it. So now it's up to the chair of the House Judiciary Committee, Jerry Nadler, um, to schedule a markup. A markup is a session where they consider amendments, vote on the amendments, vote on the bill, then the next step is the floor. He's not doing that. Why isn't he doing that? We don't know why. But, but it's the kind of thing where, all right, well, getting his constituents to tell him that's good, but if we can tell other legislators, we, we were just meeting with some Washington state legislators today saying, you know, please ask your colleagues to push pressure on the South House Judiciary Committee to have a vote. And pe having them hear from people that this is a bill that they care about, that really makes a difference in terms of what they what they spend their time on. Sorry. And, you know, I, if I just can say, I mean, this is, an, you know, another bill you know, that that example of the um, the woman whose rape kit was then uh, turned around and used against her later, you know, this is another example of that kind of potential harm, right? If we do not clamp down um, on the, the, the ability of law enforcement to just buy all the data they want and uh, complete profiles on people, um, you know, it means that there is this very creepy ability to decide um, that there's someone you want to target, right? So whether that's for political reasons, whether that's um, because you simply disagree with them on particular issues, or, you know, they're a, a person from a marginalized group, there's many, many reasons um, why it's just a bad idea um, to have that not be restricted. And so it's, it's a really important one to push. Um, Oh, thanks so much, Keith, for putting that in the chat. So the text from the slide is now in the chat if anybody wants to pull from that for letters to lawmakers. Should we um, move on, John? Yeah, let, let, you know, just a brief moment on the bigger picture, which applies to all of these laws, but particularly the ADPPA. And you know, before we get, as this will bring us into the future casting, the big picture of what's going on here is Big tech wants to pass very weak regulation in states and then say, well, there's a patchwork of, 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 of state regulation. And so we need to solve that. We need to have a single preemptive federal law and, and get that to be weak too. So if Congress doesn't pass ADPPA, big tech's gonna be pushing it in the states next year or maybe even weaker bills. And then they'll take another try at, at federal legislation. But you know, that's a game that two can play we can also be pushing some of these strong bills in the states. The Fourth Amendment is not for sale act. That's, that's one that I think is gonna pass nationally. If these others don't pass nationally this session, well, we can take them to the states as well. And yeah, answering the chest question from the chat, as Maya, uh, as Maya says, the, uh, the, the, slides will, the slides will be available afterwards, yes. Yeah, uh, should we, I do a little future casting as well here? Yeah, we, we should have a slide on this. <laughs> uh, I insisted that John leave our goofy uh, Q&A about the slide itself in the slide as uh, just kind of some light humor for folks in a peek into the process of collaborating um, on presentation. So some future casting. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, what John said about that sort of overall strategy, um, national to state, um, privacy bills. Um, you know, I certainly have a lot of thoughts around uh, the fact that the, the bills that we've seen, um, aside from California's, and although, you know, California's could be stronger, I think there's a general sense in the state um, that they'd like to continue strengthening. Um, in terms of the, the bills that have been pushed through in Utah, um, Virginia, um, and you know the ADPPA. One of my concerns really is the fact that not only are does do they not create strong protections for current harms um, and data abuses, they also don't protect us from what 
we know is coming, right? So we know that we're moving into this whole new era um, of technological development. We're really already there, but I think it just hasn't rolled out um, massively as yet, although I think that that is um, beginning to happen around um, virtual reality, blended reality spaces, augmented reality, um, and the use of AI in virtually every area of our lives. And if we think about the need um, for privacy protect protections in that space, um, those needs are different and maybe even greater um, than those we've identified um, for data collection, you know, from cell phones and computers. Um, there is a lot of biometric uh, data harm that is possible. Um, there is, you know, a whole discussion of the tracking of movements and eye movements and, you know, all of these kinds of um, artificial intelligence and machine learning systems that are essentially going to be studying human movement and reaction and emotion. We've, um, we saw that Fight for the Future had a Dear Zoom letter about, you know, please don't use our Zooms to train your emotional AI. Um, I think we're going to be seeing more and more um, kind of egregious forms of harm and invasive um, technologies and research um, in, in into our lives um, in in the coming years. Um, and so I think for me, you know, future casting, it's really about protecting our rights as um, as folks in states to be able to bring stronger laws to protect people from things we know are coming and also things we haven't really fully anticipated um, that may be intersecting with those. Yeah, I mean, basically what Maya says, uh, you know, a couple things, a couple things to add is I've been a privacy activist for a long time and and things have just changed so much in the last couple of years and then just on overdrive in the last three months. For a long time, people, you know, well, privacy is only for people who have something to hide. People get that, wow, everybody needs privacy. Um, and so I think I think we're we're seeing when Maya talks about changes in the states, I think it's easier at the state level to work across party lines because all these feelings, you know, all this move, it's it's bipartisan. People in both parties don't like the big tech right now. And to a large extent, the underlying political dynamic of the privacy battles isn't on party lines, it's corporate members of each party siding with industry against the populists and people and progressives who who side more with the people. And like I say, nobody really likes big tech these days. So yeah, does any of the the this legislation introduce the idea of anonymized data collection, pandemic contagion tracking? Yeah, the pandemic contagion tracking um, is the kind of thing that that really highlights some of these kinds of issues. So uh, there's a big question about how to word mo the uh, the ADPPA exempts what's called de-identified data, and you can do things with de-identified data. HIPAA similarly exempts de-identified data, but man, that's led to a lot of privacy leaks. So the 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 right way to come to craft an exemption for valid public health purposes that doesn't allow people to be targeted doesn't allow um, people's COVID data to be used against them in any way, crafting the right language for that is one of the things that I think is is very, that, that we think the Health and Location Data Privacy Act has done a much better job, sorry, Data Protection Act, um, has done a much better job at than, than say, ADPPA. Um, I, can, I, if I, can yes. I add something to that real quick, John, which is, I think, I mean, that is a really important point. And I think um, in terms of the de-identified de data, you know, we've really been spinning this out a lot with Washington privacy organizers. You know, what does this mean? How could that be achieved? Um, there's this idea that you can just like split up uh, a name from a data set and it's all good. Um, and I think there are a lot of um, lawmakers who don't really understand just how difficult it is to de-identify a, a data in such a way that it is simply not re-identifiable. Um, that is a very tricky and detailed process. And I think what it is going to need on a legislative level is for um, real experts in data to sit down and craft 
language that can um, describe an enforcement process where um, companies or data collectors will have to describe the steps they took to de-identify um, and, and explain how they are 100% certain, right, that they have collected anonymous and anonymized data. Um, so I think that'll be part of it. And then I think the other piece of that is, you know, you've got, if you're going to do that, you've got to, you've got to take profit out of the picture. It really does have to be um, for the public good. And so I think that's a very, you know, that's very tricky. And I think um, we've obviously been struggling with that for, for years um, in terms of trying to get ourselves some good data privacy laws on the books. Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. And yeah, Chance uh, brings up that the AI art programs essentially steal from artists. Uh, they copy and emulate the existing style of human artists and they're trained on, on this data. Similarly, there's, there's a, um, a, a Microsoft's GitHub Copilot uh, will help you with your code. Oh, but it's trained on everybody else's code, so it could well spit out my code fragments in somebody else's, in somebody else's data. This is, we think of it in terms of copyright, we think of it in terms of privacy. Did I give my permission for my art to be used that way? Almost certainly not. Um, Scott notes that we might want to put profit in the picture, at least partially with expanded private rights of action. Um, you know, the private right of action is another kinds of things. Um, yeah, it, it's another one of the, these areas that, that it's, there's, there really are tensions in, in, in the privacy law about how to use, how to use these things to retain greediness and profit while still, while still allowing businesses to operate. Um, Maya, did you want to take the uh, Watson's question on the federal biometric privacy law? Yeah, I kind of answered in the in the chat. Yeah. I mean, I think you know. I mean, I I as an organizer, I'm very very interested in seeing um, super strong biometrics restrictions put in place. Um, but obviously, again, a floor, not a ceiling. Um, I think we are really at the beginning of exploring how that is going to affect our worlds, um, and that is partially because you know there's there's some intersections with science and medicine as well here um, that I think we haven't even begun to explore in terms of in terms of data privacy and so I think um, yeah it's going to be an evolving field for sure but I do think a, a federal um, floor of restrictions would be really helpful and, and, and Watson brings up a BIPA BIPA that's that's Illinois biometric something protection or privacy act um that's that's it passed about 12 years ago before big tech was so successful at lobbying it's got a very strong private right of action when you read about these hundred million dollar settlements or hundred million dollar class action suits that's always under bipa and and that's why it's such a critical rule uh, clearview ai when they got when they got found guilty under a BIPA, they ha they've had to stop selling their bogus facial recognition stuff anywhere in the United States. We need that kind of strong enforcement. Uh, ADPPA had an exemption for BIPA. Well, that's good, but what about other places? Washington currently has a very mediocre biometrics model, but legislators are working to make it better. It's like, We've talked with um, a couple of state legislators about it. We want to be able to do that. And I think that answers Aaron's question a little bit. Are today's legislators still a little clueless or are they starting to understand? You know, it's hard to, it's, you know, that's a broad brush there. Like, <laughs> it's hard to answer that for, you know, every legislator, state and federal. But I think um, it does seem like there is a growing awareness and certainly um, this is very complicated by, you know, where you are politically, where you are on, um, you know, overreaches of law enforcement. You know, do you consider certain things overreaches or do you think that they're necessary? This is um, honestly a global conversation we're having right now because bio biometrics is um, being discussed in many countries in relation to identification. Um, and not just here in the U.S., um, as well as being used, you know, digital IDs and um, creating sort of standards in digital IDs across the globe and also within nations. And so this is a huge discussion. But I think ultimately, 
um, most privacy advocates would agree that um, this is this is a dangerous <laughs> uh, place to um, allow to to not not be legislated and not be dealt with. Um, we need our privacy protected. And once you go into the area of collecting everyone's biometrics, um, data security just becomes an incredibly difficult area and very risky. Um, the threat modeling there is kind of ridiculous. And so, um, yeah, I guess I'll stop blabbing. Anything else to add, John? Yeah, well, no, I mean, it's a good question from Aaron. And, and what I'd say is there's increasing number of legislators of legislators who either get it or realize they're clueless and have a good staffer who gets it. That's very important in Congress. In Congress, having a, a good staffer um, who, who really gets it, that they have so little time to spend on any one issue that they're very reliant on their staff. Uh, it often goes, often not always goes around age, uh, around age. Um, and, and this I, is something that, oh, go ahead. I was just going to add one thing to that, which is that um, I, I also want to push back on that question. You know, are today's legislators still close? I think today's people are, <laughs> you know, I think, I think we really need to be educating, you know, everyday folks on all of this stuff. We need a lot more um sort of popular education on data privacy biometrics um all of these areas because most folks just don't have any clue um i think i think the overturning of roe has started to change that i think we have a, in that sense a great opportunity to educate folks but i think that's part of raising the awareness of legislators because what matters to people is going to have to matter to legislators and so that's another sort of aspect of that and it really ties to something we've done a lot in Washington State. So in Washington State, for the last four years, big tech has tried to, tried to pass a very weak privacy bill. I call it the Bad Washington Privacy Act, just to remind everybody, no, this is bad. Uh, and so we've testified in hearings, we've had meetings with legislators, and it's not just the usual privacy circle who does it. It's not the local equivalent of the people who attend EF Georgia meetings regularly. It's also, we've also gotten into the broader community. You know, I'm, I'm a farmer from Snohomish and here's why I care. I'm a retired nurse. I got this data breach notice from, from a company I've never heard of, what's going on? And so this helps legislators understand. Yeah, I'm I, just I looking at the, oh, sorry, go ahead, John. I was gonna say, I dropped something in the chat from a, a Washington state representative who, who gets it really well, this is Brandy Donaghy, when she was a, uh, she actually wrote this before she was a legislator, when she was an activist working on privacy stuff, but hey, now she's in the legislature. So we get more voices over time. Yeah, this yeah is I just, Scott. oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Scott. And this is Scott, I just wanted to say to our participants, yeah, at this point, I think we, if you want to, if you want to turn on your microphone or your camera at this point, uh, this is, it's okay to do so now, because we've been in, Question and answer. Yeah, we, 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 we've, we've been in QA mode for, for a while. Maya, should, should we like ask that? Yeah, why don't I just close this out real yeah, quick? Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. so, so we've put all those calls to action in the chat um, on, on each of the bills that we have. Um, we don't have one on the location, uh, I believe, right? On the health yeah, and data. Yeah, yeah. Uh -oh. we don't have an action there. If someone wants to create one, hey, great. Um, we've been actually trying to work on doing that. So um, hopefully we'll have one to share after this webinar with folks. Um, so just a couple of things. Um, reminder to call and email your lawmakers in DC and also reach out to your local lawmakers and let them know that this matters to you. Um, and, you know, John and I are happy to help facilitate privacy talks, privacy workshops, trainings, if that's a thing people have, um, groups have a need for. Uh, we are we are big privacy nerds, um, both of us now. Um, as, as you can tell, we, we, we like to talk about this. We do, uh, and text and, you know, meet with lawmakers. So um, yeah, sub subscribe to John's newsletter, which is the Nexus of Privacy. Um, and then if you, you know, if you can help support this work further, I'm working on um, getting together a national organizing entity, which would be People's Privacy Network, trying to get that off the ground. And that would be sort of a, a national table um, for folks from multiple states with the idea of hopefully some people's laws. 
um, coming forward in the absence of federal ones. So if you can support that, that would be great. Um, I think John just plunked a GoFundMe link um, in the chat. Anything else you want to add to close this out, John? No, I, I'm just, just to echo, um, big tech has a lot of money, a lot of lobbyists. There's great organizations like, like EFF, like Media Justice, uh, like Ultraviolet, who are great on private. They, they don't have a lot of resources. They are surprisingly small. EFF's the biggest of them, and they're dwarfed by any one of these big tech companies. Grassroots organizing, groups like EF Georgia, groups like our Washington Poor Organize, Privacy Organizers groups, groups like Maya's Washington People's Privacy. That's a really important complement at the state level and federally. The problem is, wow, it's really hard to, to, to get funding for this. It's hard to get grants for this. And so that's why relying on crowdfunding is, is just really important at this stage of the game. So I'm kind of calling it organizer mutual aid in a way. It's kind yeah, of, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's a way to try to help us continue the work. Um, be, when when folks can crowdfund that, I think we have um, a better chance of continuing the work. And I know that one thing I've noticed in working with some of the bigger groups on the federal advocacy is that, you know, John and I um, really read the bills deeply. Um, so do some of the other organizers that we work with um, and have a very different process of doing that, even than some of the um, the well-funded organizations and paid staffers who may have a million other things on their plate, right? Um, and so it's important work. Um, looks like there's a question. Do you want to take that, John? Yeah, I, I was just going to move us on to Q&A time. Well, and first of all, thanks once again, everybody, for all your time. Really appreciate it. We're we're happy to stay around and talk as as long as uh, as as long as people want. Um, uh, Michael, a, a great question. Does ADPPA prevent the use of automated decisions or stop the use of AI from circumventing privacy? This is a great question. Good example of Google or Facebook wrongfully closing accounts based on AI decisions. It does not prevent that. It does um, the automated system. So there's language in there that has some stuff about getting information about how the algorithms behave in order to detect un unlawful discrimination. So these are the But it's not nearly stringent enough. But what's not there, unlike Unlike California's law, California has a right to opt out of automated profiling. ADPPA does not have that right. Uh, I actually testified about about this at the uh, at the FTC open forum they had last week. The FTC is considering doing some rulemaking on on privacy, and so they had a an open forum. Just amazing public comments from a, a lot of people and. And I talked about that. I'll, I'll drink the, drop the link in the chat. Um, you know, really good question. And it also shows how complex this, this is and how broadly it, uh, it affects things. I would also add to that, you know, that ADPPA actually has an exemption for inferences, right, that, that may be made. Um, so, I mean, there's just so much that it doesn't deal with um, in terms of AI and automated decision systems. Okay, um, uh, right now we are continuing to record and stream. If you'd like to ask any more on the record questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat or um, uh, turn on your microphone or camera. Um, we will be off the record soon. So if you'd like to wait, that's also okay. Um, Larry says, thanks for all the info and context um, activity in this arena is overwhelming. Yeah, yeah, it, it is somewhat. <laughs> Um, and it and it's quite. I mean, I I sort of put in one of the slides the image of a diver diving into the soup because in some ways it does feel like that when you're really taking a deep dive into this area of the law. Uh, it looks like John has put um, some additional links in the chat um, for Nexus of Privacy. Yeah. Well, no, this was about about um, Michael's on question on automated decision. And this, this is what this is where my day job kicks in. I was on the Washington State Automated Decision Systems Work Group where we looked at government use of these automated decision systems. So don't get me started talking on that or I'll never stop, but I but I will drop <laughs> some links in there. Hey Aaron, did you have a question? 
Yeah, I wanted to um, touch on, you know, there's a lot of, um, I think we, as a society, we're facing real big challenges uh, with the manipulation of young people by the social media um, uh, giants, um, uh, you know, to the point where suicide rates of young women are going to be stealing, uh, things like that. Do you, do we see anything in these in this legislation that is going to help address that at any level? You know, just in, in theory, at least, you know. Just one. Great, great question. I mean, that's what that's what motivated the uh, the Kids Online Safety Act that I talked about. And California has just passed a kids design code that that tries to regulate this, and it, it's a huge problem. Something needs to be done. It's it's challenging to work out what needs to be done that doesn't have the unintended consequences of of triggering too much surveillance. We'll see, um, but I think there's some good things in 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 both of these laws, and we'll see what kind of effect they have. And I think legislators, you know, legislators have so clearly heard this is a problem that they really want to do something about it. Um, Yeah, so, um, yeah, Flo Flo Florence brings up that, it, you know, it's it's hard to understand all this stuff. And so, and so looking to trusted voices like EFF, I mean, EFF rarely gets things wrong. I don't always agree with EFF, but their analysis is always very clear and their recommendations for actions are, are, are very solid. Um, you know, other groups fight for the future. Maya mentioned media justice. Color of change is a good group to uh, to to look to. They've just introduced their black tech agenda. Yeah, I'm so excited about this. I want to talk about this. Um, if you are familiar with Color of Change, they have just yesterday launched finally um, their black tech agenda, in which they do call for. Um, strong privacy laws, as well as um, laws regulating algorithmic bias. And so um, I'm really excited to see that. I've been kind of waiting for them to to come out with that. And it's finally here. So um, you can, they've, they've got a hashtag. It's hashtag um, Black Tech Agenda. So you can find that on in the Twitterverse and Insta and such. Okay, are there any? Okay, there's another question we've got. So I'll read this one out loud. This is a broad question. Um, do you all have any thoughts or resources you'd recommend on learning about data sovereignty, data unions, um, or ideas of what successful businesses built on owning your own data might look like? Awesome question. Ooh, um, John, do you want to start there? Yeah. Um, so at the technical level, a lot of work uh, on data sovereignty, the, uh, the, the things to search on are under self-sovereign IDs. Um, uh, there, there, there's a book I'd recommend when, when, when I get a, when I stop talking, I will, I will look it up and see if I can drop, drop the link. And that's, that's at the very deep technical data level. Um, ideas about what successful businesses built on owning your own data might look like. That's a great question. And I think a lot of people are ref uh, wrestling with it, myself included. Um, I think one one key thing is, I think subscription models are what come up the most. I think consent based models make a lot of sense. I actually believe that a lot of people will opt into advertising and marketing as long as it's not targeted, uh, and people want to see relevant stuff, right? I mean, I don't I don't want to see. Um, I, I don't currently have a dog. I don't want to see ads for dog food. And so in the right situations, if people will trust you, which means trusting that you're being very responsible with the data, minimizing how much data you want to, you want to collect, I think those kinds of things can be, can possibly be businesses. And I hope that, you know, as regulation shapes, shapes things, part of the goal here is to enable, um, opportunities for for companies that that are are doing the right way you want right now the rules are stacked for surveillance capitalism companies microsoft amazon google they write the laws they benefit them 
we want to change that. We want to change things so, so that the laws really are built on people who are trying to do the right thing, own their own data and things like that. Um, yeah, I, if I can add, you know, I would also say that there's a huge opportunity here to um, to explore rulemaking that 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 creates a field for that to happen in, and also to look at the the way that um, climate is a huge piece of this. I mean, we know that data centers take up a huge amount of energy. Um, to cool them as well as space and materials. And it's actually better better for us to minimize, to minimize um, and do responsible data collection. We don't need to have this sort of like mass surveillance data capitalism um, continue. We can, we can change course and we can do so in a way that, you know, helps us socially as well as our climate and our environment. So I think that's also an opportunity here um, for having that discussion. Um, I know that I was looking into um, ARPA funds and I was realizing that, that, my, that my county that I live in had received ARPA funds that were earmarked for building data centers. You know, I, I know the county, I know the landscape here. Um, I'm not so excited about them using large swaths of land to build data centers here unless they are, you know, absolutely needed. And I, and I think, you know, the, the reality is that we may see you know, similar to we to the way that we we saw with factory farming, we may see such an explosion of this into the future if we don't clamp down on this, um, that we actually lose tons of valuable land to data centers, and that I don't think anyone really um, wants to see that. But the time to set that policy is now, and so um, creating good laws around this is is also important for that reason. I, I, I found the uh, the link and I dropped it in 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 the chat. Uh, it's, it's called the uh, Domains of Identity by by Kalia Young. And, and I think this is you know it, it's something that we're all we're all wrestling with. And and hopefully I I didn't give you any great examples. And hopefully that'll be different in a year or two. Yeah, as Freya says, the time to fight back is now while we can because. You know, and this is why we pay, fight so hard on on these uh, not, bills that are not what they should be. Because once Congress passes something, they're not going to go back to it and make it better. No, 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 no. They're going to, um, like the classic FERPA uh, student privacy bill passed in the 90s. HIPAA passed in the 90s. They haven't touched them since then. ECPA passed in the 80s, hasn't been updated. So when we when we pass something, it's going to be there for a while. Yeah, so completely agree. Yeah, and if you really think about that, you know, if you really, I mean, I know everyone here is interested in technology, so that's not a difficult task. If you really think about a law passed in the 90s that hasn't really been, you know, substantially updated in 2022, that's crazy. I mean, we have seen a huge boom in what is technically possible and an enormous explosion of the collection of data um, and so it just, it, it just doesn't, you know, it doesn't make sense for us to not know that, understand it and think ahead when we're looking at laws. Um, and, and, at the, and at the same time, if you look back at these laws, uh, they're, they're a lot stronger than, than some of these laws that have been, that have been proposed now. I mean, the best laws now are just as good as the best laws have ever been, or probably better. Fourth amendment is not for sale. That's a great law. My body, my data, that's a great law. But HIPAA, for example, uh, when you look at its law enforcement exceptions, even if there's a warrant, if somebody has an ethical duty to disobey, uh, HIPAA, HIPAA says that they can, that, that A, they can't share data with law enforcement without a warrant, and then B, even with a warrant, if there's an ethical duty, because these are doctors and medical pe people, that overrides the warrant. Now, when you look at legislation like the ADPPA, oh, now there's, there's no restrictions at all. It just shows how while these bills are old, they're at a higher level because again, tech was not as good at lobbying back then. Yeah, yeah, Angel points to the uh, solid project. I think that's a really interesting uh, technical approach to owning your own data, putting yourself in control of your own data. I, I don't know if there's been a lot of progress on doing business models around that yet. Uh, 
but it's but it's but it but you know it's important that technically we've got these building blocks coming. I think Kim uh, Kim Berners Lee of of the World Wide Web fame is associated with that, I believe. I think Keith might have been about to, or Scott, someone I think was a, raised their hand maybe or was about to pop in. Their hand raised. Yeah, we've got a few more minutes. So uh, maybe uh, last question or two. We have one. And and Scott, were there any other questions in the streaming platforms, or are we no, good I'm on not, that? I'm not seeing that. Um, the uh, I mean the the straight the raw recordings will be available on the streaming platforms uh, for a while. Um, the Twitch Twitch keeps it up for a week, so um, you, we can go back and look at it. But there, I don't see I don't see any questions being posted. If you, I see a few people still typing. Let's get one or two more in. Um, while we're waiting I'm, I'm for, close to, I'm close to ninety minutes. So, um, while we're waiting for questions, I'm just gonna. Um, someone did ask me uh, for a little more info about the national organizing, um, and so I'm happy to return to that. Um, Let's see, Diwali asks, how can we get involved to facilitate information delivery? I'm not sure I totally understand that question. Like, do, do we have an email list that people can sign up for or anything? Um, do you have something like that, uh, Maya? I don't yet, no. Um, okay. I I do not have the funds and capacity to do yeah. a yeah, regular right. newsletter, I'm sorry. So we can certainly yeah. we can certainly work with Scott to get information to um, for now to Electronic Frontiers Georgia and share once we've got something um, something better involved. If you're on social media, um, following following our social media channels, EFF is very good about sending out action alerts. So so sign up for uh, their actions. I think that's another good way. Yeah, Electronic uh, Frontiers Georgia does have a, a mailing list, but it's not restricted to privacy questions. Uh -huh. Keith, if you're on, maybe you could post the uh, ef-georgia.org website. It's at the very top of the chat window. Okay, okay. Cool. And I just threw in the chat, you know, um, since I, I don't have a, a newsletter or capacity to do that this time, but I, I do try to post regularly on, on Twitter and Instagram. Um, they, I don't have them linked. And so they're not always identical info on each one, <laughs> but if you're on either of those platforms, um, I know not everyone is even comfortable with those. I'm not on Facebook, um, with Washington people's privacy. That just feels, uh, sort of silly. Um, and Instagram is kind of the compromise uh, that I've made to make sure I'm reaching out to millennials and younger <laughs> um, who don't always use Twitter. So. Okay, I, I guess what, 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 I was going to say, Maya, why don't you say just a little bit about the national organizing? Okay, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, sure. I'll just very briefly, basically, um, because I, I came into this work with the experience of um, running an electoral campaign, so being a big part of a people's ballot initiative campaign, we did municipal ballot initiatives, but um, moving from that space and then into the state legislative advocacy space of privacy um, and biometric stuff, I really realized that you know due to the huge um, lobbying power of tech, due to the fact that, that um, we do face a, a really uphill battle um, when it comes to passing very good laws that isn't uh, that aren't dominated by sort of the need for accommodating um, profit uh, that we may actually need to pass our own laws and we may need to do that state by state in a very similar but differently motivated way um, than tech lobbyists are so um, my goal is to try to create a, a national table um, that can be both an organizing meeting place and a resource um, and hopefully pass uh, really good people's laws um, in many states at once is my dream. And so doing that will take um, planning, it will take a, a good amount of funding, and it will take um, bringing, as I've termed it, uh, a dream team of, of 
privacy law writers to the table. So that's kind of in a nutshell what I'm going after. Do you want to say anything else about that, John? <laughs> uh, de desperately needed and um, yeah, strongly, it, it, we really need something like this. So thanks, thanks much for all the discussion and all the great questions. Yeah, thank yeah. you all for being here and thank you, Scott, for holding the space and inviting us to it. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I do need to go ahead and wrap up the official stream and recording it this time. If you've got any final thoughts uh, or you'd just like to, to, to say goodbye at this time. Yeah, I, Thanks let's keep working. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and take action. We, we dropped a bunch of links there and we'll, we'll work with Scott to get them sent out and, and let's keep talking. And I just want to add, like, you know, take action, yes, to sign the petitions, talk to lawmakers. But even if taking action for you is bringing this up at a dinner dinner conversation with a friend or with your mom on the phone or whatever, you know, I think I think that's also action. Um, talking about this and how important it is is also action. Thanks, y'all. <laughs>